Well, good morning. I don't know about you, but there are some days when you come to church and the worship just blows you away. And today is definitely one of those days. And um, I think that revelation we had yesterday morning about the pinnacle of everything is that we are created to be in relationship and worship God. Um, It's just like a light bulb that has gone off in my head this morning. It just felt that we were demonstrating exactly what we were talking about yesterday. Um, So I'm going to share a few thoughts. Uh, One thing I would say is that um, I'm not a theologian. I've had no formal training, but I do believe that um, God has revealed some insights to me over the last week or so since I've been looking at these passages. Now, when I I read scripture, sometimes I read it and I go, yeah, so, don't get it. Um, And John chapter 1, the first 14 verses that we're going to hear later that Juliet reads, is one of those scriptures that when I first read it, I was like, oh, yeah, don't get it. Okay, move on, come back to it. But as you read and reread and look at other scriptures and, you know, the lectionary, the Anglican lectionary is beautifully put together, three readings for us this morning. God just little by little reveals a bit of himself to us as we go deeper with him. And my take on it may not be your take on it. It is my take on it. But I do believe that God wants to speak to each one of us this morning. And he may have already done that through the worship. He may have done that through one of the prayers you've heard. He may do that through me. He may do that by the sunshine out of the window this morning, all these beautiful flowers on the the windowsill there. I mean, how many of you got up this morning and thought, well, that's unusual. It's light. You'd be surprised if the sun doesn't go down tonight and it doesn't get dark at some point, wouldn't you? We just take God for granted and we don't even see him. So one thing I would say to you, hopefully when we leave here today, we will see God in everything. So let's just pray. Father God, as we come before you now and we hear your word, I pray that each heart in this room will be open to hear your voice. As individually as you've created us, Father, I pray that you will touch us in a unique way, that we will be transformed by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to start with Nao, who's going to read from Proverbs for us. Thanks, Nao. Wisdom's call. It's interesting that wisdom um, is her certainly in the NIV version, does not understand in raise her voice. I think like with many mysteries in the, uh, in the scriptures, our language can't quite grasp the enormity of God. And um, here it demonstrates that God is male and female, and he has created us in his likeness and image, both male and female. Um, but the, this whole sense of... Um, the call of wisdom shows that wisdom is primary and fundamental to God. It's a fundamental, it's a foundation. It's a foundation on which all life is built. And the reference um, in Colossians that we'll hear um, in a minute when Thelma reads for us um, alludes to to this, um, where Jesus' presence is at the creation of the world. It's highlighted in verses 15 to 17, and we'll hear that in a minute. But the whole of the the chunk of um, Proverbs that we've heard here describing the activities of God as he created the world and set the boundaries and the horizons and the dust of the earth set the heavens in place. I mean, it's incredible. Anything to do with creation really blows my mind, and I'll expand on that a bit later. But this particular um, section reminds me of um, Job when he says in chapter 30, I cry out to you, God, but you don't answer. You just look at me. Um, You know, he's had a tough life. Let's be honest. It's been a bit difficult. He's had a few challenges. And he gets to the point where he says, you know, what's going on? You've done nothing for me. And eight chapters later, in chapter 38, God's reply comes, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? 
where were you when I did all this stuff? In other words, who do you think you are? Yeah? When you question God, try reading Job chapter 38 to yourself. Jackie, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Yeah, your boss might be giving you a hard time, but let's put it all in perspective. So, um, yeah, try it sometime. It is quite a shocker. You know, the creator of the whole universe, and sometimes we decide we're going to question him. We're going to doubt him. We're going to, you know, we're going to think we know better than he does. And we've all done it, right? I can see a few people nodding. Yeah, we've all done it. Whether we want to admit it or not, we've done it. So let's move on and uh, hear from the lovely Thelma, please, from Colossians. So verse 15 says, The Son is the image of the invisible God. The image of. Many of us, well, all of us, are part of a a family, however big or small, and... um, Very often you'll hear things like, oh, you're just like your mother or you look just like your father. When I ring my mum, it takes her about 15 seconds to work out whether it's me or my sister. We sound so alike. So alike, in fact, that if I hear back a message I've left on an answer phone for Jim, I often think it's her because I don't sound like her when I'm speaking to you, but I do sound like her when I hear it recorded back. And there's that kind of resemblance, a similarity, if you like. But here, um, the, the root word that is used here um, is something far more exact. It, it's, it's the same. It's an exact representation. It's not a, a poor imitation. It, it is the same, one and the same. And I think that it, we struggle very often to understand the concept of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Trinity. And, and the more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. And that's why it is a mystery because we don't know all the answers. But one thing is for sure that every time we look at Jesus, every time we read about Jesus, he is pointing the way to the Father. He is, in human form, demonstrating who the Father is. And through him, we get to see God. We don't get to see all of God because we just couldn't. If you think of Moses, when he asked to see the the glory of God, you know, he had to go before him and, and hide away. He couldn't look directly at God because it would kill him. That's how awesome God is. But Jesus is the exact representation of God. He's, he doesn't just reflect God, he reveals God to us. And through his death, he reconciles us back to the Father by doing it himself. And I still can't quite grasp that, that he sends a piece of himself to bring us back to himself. It just blows my mind. You know, that's how important we are to God. The last verse in Proverbs that we read earlier says, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. And sometimes you look at the world and you think, why? Why would you rejoice in mankind when we're getting it so terribly wrong? We're screwing up day after day after day. But God loves us so much that he sent us Jesus, that he would reconcile us back to the Father by taking upon himself what we deserved. Through the grace of God, we were given this gift of Jesus. It really is quite or inspiring it's mind-blowing I can't say any more than that um, but I really want to focus um, today on the next reading that Juliet's going to read us now from John 1 so as I said earlier I don't know about you but that particular section of scripture can be quite challenging to read and understand but actually the more you read it, the clearer it becomes that within those first 14 verses of John, you've got the whole of everything. It's just all there, the, the whole purpose of God from before the beginning, because you can't start at the beginning with God, because God operates outside of time, which is another concept that we can't grasp. 
you know, for Doctor Who fans, perhaps it's easier, but for most of us, the, the concept of traveling through and outside of time I is just so difficult because we are so driven by it. You know, I, I, I've got an appointment at three o'clock today. I'm going to my mum's house for dinner because Jim's away and I obviously can't look after myself. So I have to go at three o'clock <laughs> to be fed by my mum because I'm only 48 and I couldn't possibly do that on my own. Um, but, you know, we're, we're so caught up in, in schedules and timetables and, and, and time and days and dates. And, and it restricts us so much because God operates outside all of that. He, you know, he, he works outside all of that. And I think that's why sometimes we misinterpret or misunderstand why God works in the way he does or appears not to be working because it, it's not in our time. It's in his time. It's in his way. And when we actually let go and let God, then he does his thing. And you look back and you go, yeah, that was the right time. It didn't seem like it at the time, but it was the right time. In the beginning. So as soon as you read that, it takes you back to Genesis. It takes you back to the beginning of the Bible. As I've said, John is alluding to something far bigger than that. He's going back into eternity because the Father, Jesus, the Holy they've always been there. The creation story is a wonderful story, and it, it doesn't get much space in the Bible, actually. If you consider the whole of creation, it happens very quickly in a few verses in chapter 1 um, and into chapter 2. And it doesn't really do justice to the, the whole of creation, how awesome God is. It blows my mind when I think about creation. Um, I see God in creation. I don't know about other people here. I see him every day in creation. I was in Northern Ireland last weekend. Um, I was working, and I use that term loosely. I spoke at a church for 10 minutes on Sunday morning and for four hours on Tuesday, and the rest of the time I spent with my colleague traveling around Northern Ireland looking at beautiful scenery. We went to the Giant's Causeway and saw that incredible structure of volcanic rock that has been naturally formed that is one of the natural wonders that people flock to see from all over the place. And it is awesome. It's jaw-dropping when you see it. We spent some time in the mountains of Morn, and they were snow-topped. You know, there'd been some snow. It was beautiful. And you can see God in his creation. And we commented on it everywhere that we could see God in his creation. But the people who lived there were so used to these things being there, it wasn't special to them anymore. They didn't notice it anymore. I read somewhere this week that all the stars in the universe may equal, may, they can't count them, but may equal all the grains of sand on all the beaches on the planet. That's a lot of stars, right? That is huge. Up until 1920s, we thought the universe was restricted to the Milky Way, of which we are a part. And since then, we've discovered there are billions of galaxies beyond the one that we live in. Now, this one's big enough. This one is big enough. And right now, the Milky Way, this is going to blow your mind. If nothing else blows your mind today, this will. Apparently, the Milky Way rotates at 490,000 miles an hour. That's quite fast. <laughs> that is quite... 490,000 miles an hour. And to do one rotation will take 200 million years and that's just our galaxy wow and we're just a little you know our little solar system within our little galaxy our little church our little people 
It just blows my mind. Who is God that he is mindful of me? We sing that song often, don't we? Here is a God who's created the whole universe through Jesus, with him, in the beginning, way back. And he cares about me. And he cares about you. Enough to give us all an individual fingerprint. You know, it's... It makes no sense to me. Through him all things were made. It blows my mind. The reference to um, the word being with God is far more, again, our English language limits us, um, was the word, and the word was with God. That with isn't like, I'm with you guys this morning. It's not that kind of with. It's much deeper than that. It's about a very deep relationship. And God has called us all to be in relationship with him. It's fundamental to who he is. It's absolutely fundamental. And he demonstrates that right from the beginning, before time began, with the relationship he has with the son that was demonstrated when he came. I'm so blown away by some of these facts that it's difficult to even put it in context, to be completely honest with you. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the fact that he was with God, the Word, Jesus, was with God, means he's distinct from God the Father, but then he is God, so he's the same as the Father. And we can battle with that. But we just have to trust that both those tr truths are exactly that. That that is fundamental to what we believe. That he's distinct from God, but is God. An exact representation, as we said before. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So all those stars, all those grains of sand equivalent out there in the cosmos... And the interesting thing is that the words that John uses in this text, in the original, um, would have related to both Jews and Greeks. It, it's really important when you start delving in that you understand that in the day there was so much division that actually there was a lot of unity through the words that are used. And I, as I say, I'm no scholar, but when I looked into it, the, the root words of these, and if you can ever go back, you know, we haven't got time now, if you can go back to the roots of some of these words, it actually makes a lot more sense. And it was really important that he was speaking to all sections of the community, the Jews and the Greeks, that there was a sense that they could both understand what he was trying to say. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. There are so many references in the Bible to light, re referencing Jesus. The lights are on in here. If we flick that switch, it's not going to make a whole heap of difference, right? In actual fact, can you just hit that light switch for me? Doesn't make much difference, does it? But ladies, if you go next door and someone turns that light out, <laughs> that's a problem, right? That, you know, it's only next door, but there's no windows, there's no light. Light is really important. And the important thing here is that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You can put a light in a dark room and you can see. You can't put darkness in a light room. Darkness cannot overcome the light. That's great news, isn't it? Darkness cannot overcome the light. Light can only dispel darkness. It only works the other way. So if Jesus is the light, and we're called to imitate Jesus as the light, we can move mountains. We can change the world, quite literally, by doing our bit, by being our little light, this little light of mine and all the rest of it. 
You remember the, uh, the Olympics when they lit the torch and they all carried the petals, those cop were they copper petals? And then they put them down and they all came together and they made that huge, great, it was, ama it was so clever, but it was so spiritual to me that all those little bits came together to make the big thing. And they say, don't they, that, that coals, you know, once a coal leaves the fire, it'll go out. But we have to stay together. God brought us into relationship with him through Jesus because we are created to be in relationship. We are relational people. Our office um, where I work, we had to leave at the end of November. Uh, so two months ago now. And nine of us have all been working from home remotely. We've got the internet, we've got access to the server, we've got paperwork, we've got email, and that's fine. But I'm climbing the walls because there is nobody to talk to. And Jim's in Sierra Leone, and there, there's no cup of tea coming every half hour. <laughs> you know? And I really miss that. And you can tell him I've stood up here and said that because I was like, leave me alone, I'm working. But I'm like, where's my cup of tea? We are built, we are wired to be relational. And that if we need it and God wants it with us, then how awesome is that? That he wants to be in relationship with us. Oh dear. <laughs> and then there's this section about that references John the Baptist. We were talking about John the Baptist yesterday as one of the people called by God and how incredible that he went to prepare the way for God. Whereas normally we ask God to go ahead of... Well, we should ask God to go ahead of us. We don't always do that. But John the Baptist came to prepare the way, to make way for the true light that was coming. And he went to great lengths to say that he wasn't the light. He wasn't the light... Um, but he was testifying to the light. He was pointing to the light. And there's that, that great story later on um, where his, John's disciples come to him and they say, you know that other guy, you know, that Jesus, well, everyone's going to him and not you. How different if he'd have responded by saying, well, we can't have that, can we? You know, it started with me, bring them back. But he was like, no, that is what was supposed to happen. My mission is done. He's here. I've pointed the way. And all we can do in our, however we do it, is point the way to Jesus. And that's not necessarily about spouting scripture at people. It's about, hey, let's go for a coffee. It's about taking a bunch of flowers to someone, sending a get well card. It's about just taking the time to be in relationship with each other. I really appreciated the text I had from some people here just, you know, saying, how did Jim get on? Has he arrived safely in Sierra Leone? It meant that people were thinking about him and thinking about me. And that means a lot. And in this digital age, we can all do that. And sometimes it's actually better to have a conversation rather than, isn't it? We've forgotten the art of conversation. It's better to take the time to build that relationship. And in the same way, what we need to do is build our relationship with God. We need to spend time. I sat yesterday, I'd made some notes, and I sat. And I, I'm not saying this to big myself up. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. By the time I had finished reading all the scripture and thinking and contemplating, I started at four. It was half past 12. Because God was just blowing my mind with how important relationship is. That regardless of how many stars were flung into space, he cared enough to create us on this tiny dot of a planet, it just doesn't make sense. And we spend our whole lives trying to find out who we are, what is my significance, why am I here, what's the meaning of life, all those questions. But all God wants is for us to say, hi, Dad. 
He wants that kind of relationship with us, with that special to him. And he's got time for all of us. He's got no favorites. There's nothing special about being in upfront ministry. It's just as important. In fact, I think it's more important sometimes that we acknowledge the people that are behind the scenes. How many of you in recent weeks have complained when there's been no tea or coffee available when you've arrived? It never gets there by magic. People have to make it. But you notice it when it's not there. But how many of us actually thank the people who made it when it was there? It's not always about being up front. It's about working together. I think that's the, the core of what we were talking about yesterday is that we were... In the Old Testament, you see a lot of one-to-one -one calling and um, individuals picked out to play parts. And that still happens. We all have an individual call from God to do what we do. But actually, the, two, the New Testament way is more about working together in community as the body, the body of Christ made of many parts, of which we're all one. And in fact, at our last meeting, not the one yesterday, the one before, we talked about the importance of everybody knowing what their gifting is and encouraging people in their gifting. Because we're not all called to do the same thing, because if we were, we might as well all be robots. But we are all gifted. There isn't a person in this room that isn't gifted in some way. And some gifts are more obvious than others. But it's important that we all play our part. And it's a bit like when you get um, a pack of furniture from Ikea. And you get it home. And you get all the bits out. And you put it together. And you've got these bits left over. <laughs> you've been there, right? You've got these bits left over. But these bits are probably the most important bits because the thing's going to collapse without those bits. But you go, oh, well, we'll just stick it in the corner and hopefully it won't collapse. But the body of Christ is like that. We are all important. God has no favorites. It might seem like he does, but it doesn't. Because actually, for Martin being a vicar and being up front week after week, he has a huge responsibility to look after the flock. You know, that's not an easy job. It'd be much easier to take a back seat. But we've all got to play our part. And of course, this, this comes on to um, the fact that Jesus came. The true light that gives lights to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world didn't recognize him. It's a bit like, um, have you ever watched that um, Back to the Floor or Secret Millionaire or those kind of programs where people step out of their normal lives and go back to something different or pretend they're someone else just to see how people react to them? Um, the whole Bible points to Jesus. There are so many prophecies that say the Messiah is coming. And the statistics for one man fulfilling all those Old Testament prophecies has an awful lot of zeros on the end. I think to fulfill eight, it's something like one in with 28 zeros on the end. That's a lot. It's a big number. I don't know what it's called. Jesus fulfills all of those and still people missed it. Today, people are still missing it. It's a bit like the, uh, the advert. Have you seen the advert? I think it's for a Suzuki car where the guy's walking along the road and there's like billboards and flashing lights and he's just, he's just missing it. If we don't look for God, we miss him. And he's in everything. Last time we were in Tidy Church, we were horrified by what had happened at the Charlie Hebdo um, offices in France. Now, how many people here saw God in that situation? Anyone? Diane said something that day. She may even remember or may not. She said that when she saw Je suis on the banners, or when she wrote it, you take out the I, and it spells Jesus. But it is also I am. I 
am. I am who I am, says God to Moses in Exodus 3. It was everywhere. I am, I am, I am. But we've got to cross ourselves out. And then we're left with Jesus. He was everywhere in that situation. The darkness cannot take over the light. The light can only dispel darkness. We are called, just as John the Baptist was called, to show the way for those who don't know. That's amazing, isn't it? Isn't that incredible? What a responsibility you guys have got when you left, leave here today. Don't leave here the same. We know that this relates to Jesus. We know what Jesus has done for us. Don't underestimate that. It's an incredible gift to receive Jesus because through it, it says um, he gave us the right to become children of God. This isn't about a legal right. This is about the power to choose to become children of God. We, I hope everyone in this room has made that choice that we have chosen to be in the family of God, that we have chosen to be in relationship with God, with Jesus, that personal relationship where you can just be and communicate. But good relationships need time invested in them. We have to invest time. We have to pray. We have to read scripture. And what's really great and in house groups we do it, in the ministry leadership team we do it, is to actually break open scripture and get different people's perspective on it. Because sometimes someone will say something that you haven't seen and you go, now it makes sense to me. Because we're in community and we all see things differently. Someone said yesterday that it was interesting that the sign that Moses' mission was finished would be when they worshipped on the mountain. This guy's just parted the Red Sea. That's a pretty big sign. He's seen the plagues. He's, he's done all these miraculous things. But the sign that his mission is finished is that he comes back to the place where it all started when God created us to be in relationship with him and worshipping him. And it's as simple as that. That's all we're created to do. And this morning, I really got a sense of that through the beautiful worship that Andrew and Vicky led, that when we are truly ourselves in one with God through worship, there's no place better to be. And no matter how complex our lives are, if God can keep all those stars and planets and everything else in their place, out in the cosmos, how much easier is it for him to work with us to straighten out our lives? There's nothing impossible to God. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. The Bible demonstrates it's not going to be easy. And if we think it's going to be easy, then we've got it wrong. But he's not going to put us through anything we can't cope with and anything that he hasn't understood by coming himself and living himself and suffering himself and giving himself so that we can join with him in eternity. God who created the whole of everything delights in us. He delights in us. He loves us. He cares enough about us to make us all unique. Knowing us before we were born in every detail. God's before, during, and after everything. But you matter. And don't forget that. So when you look at creation, when you look at the stars, and we only see a few of them because of the lights that we have around us, just appreciate in the scheme of things how special it makes you that God cared enough to create you. Amen.